am Byron Fogan. I am a member of the class of 2008 at Albany Law School. Um, I am so honored and grateful to be here. Um, I want to thank the Wellness Initiative and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for this opportunity and um, also express a personal note of thanks to Sarah um, and Professor Connors. Um, Professor Connors, I've known since my days at Albany Law School when he was my, uh, you know, my professor in the Albany Law Clinic. And uh, Sarah, I've just been getting to know over the last couple of weeks. And uh, I think she shares my affinity for Harley Davidson motorcycles. So um, I, I'm, I'm super grateful for, for them and, and for all of you. Um, as I get started, um, like, like what was explained, um, I, I entered Albany Law School as a 30-something-year-old non-traditional student, right? I already had a number of years of experience, and, and I, I showed up at Albany Law School with, with a job already, right? So um, part of this discussion is going to include, um, you know, a discussion about how I grew to hate my client, <laughs> um, which is something that we don't talk about an awful lot, um, but I think that's, it's, it's something that we should. Um, also, my experience at Albany Law School was a little bit different because of that, um, and it allowed me to kind of hide in a way that other students couldn't. Um, I already had my job, I already had kind of some things already set up, and I already had quite a bit of experience in managing contracts when I got to Albany Law School. So um, law school allowed me to hide, particularly hide my addiction very well. And you know, that, that's important for my experience. It might not be everybody's experience, but it certainly was mine. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit. Um, what I wanna speak about today is kind of three ideas though. I, I, I'm gonna talk about my addiction generally, kind of how it's, it, uh, it was a relationship that I had to substances that overrode my ability to kind of do anything else. Um, that's going to qualify me to sit here and talk to you for about 40 minutes about addiction. Um, I'm going to do my level best to um, stay within the parameters of our time and do my level best not to kind of, you know, glorify my, my use. Um, I'm going to talk about how my addiction impacted my ability to practice our profession with professional responsibility and ethics um, and how that challenge came long before I violated any of those, that list of prohibited rules and conduct. Um, and I'm gonna share some of my ideas on how we in the profession can work to destigmatize addiction um, and encourage our colleagues and ourselves to seek help long before we run into problems, right? Um, this is a buttoned up profession. And, you know, I remember walking onto the campus for the first time and thinking, wow, this is an overwhelming thing. I'm going to be an attorney. And that means I always have to look like and present and act like an attorney. And even throwing on the mask of attorney allowed me to hide a lot of what was going on inside and a lot of what I was up to. Um, and you'll see from my story that that mask of attorney helped me avoid a lot of the consequences of my addiction um, until it didn't work anymore. So those are the three things that I hope to cover um, at the end of this. You know, I will, I will ask you questions to make sure that I did cover that <laughs> three things. Um, and we'll see where it goes from from there. I normally talk to other addicts. So this is, a, this is an interesting new experience for me. Um, I spend about 90 to 95% of my professional time today sharing my experience, strength, and hope with other addicts that we can kind of overcome our addictions together um, and 
granting hope to those people who are seeking recovery from the fir for the first time uh, that it does work. Um, that's not going to be the basis of this conversation, um, but I do think that uh, we can have some, some interesting talks and topics around this. There are three agreements that I'll ask as we get started. Um, and they're a little bit different than being a law student, right? Um, because I'm gonna ask you to approach this material with uh, a beginner's mind. Um, a lot of you come with your own experiences. Uh, you have either seen people in college or you even have family experiences or your own experiences um, with substance use and addiction. Um, but I'm gonna ask you to approach this conversation with a beginner's mind. Um, my experience is my experience. I don't think it's everybody's experience. Um, but with a beginner's mind, you may find something that you relate to, or you may find a way to relate to somebody else in addiction, whether that be a colleague, whether that be in the future, a client, um, whether that just be people in the community as you are going through your walk in life. So um, the second ask I'll have is be open-minded toward the experiences of others. Some people may ask some questions or you may hear some things that make you pause and, and uh, you know, say, hey, that's not my experience or I don't feel that way. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but approach this conversation with an open mind to the experiences of others uh, and even an open mind to your own experiences. And I'm gonna ask you to ask questions. There will be time at the end of this presentation. I don't believe that I will ramble on for a full hour. Uh, although I'm certainly capable of doing that. I, I was a lawyer for a really long time, so I could do that. Um, but I'm gonna try not to do that to you. Um, so I hope at the end you'll, you'll ask some questions and uh, we, can, we can find some answers together. Everybody in agreement with those? Just kind of raise your hand, do that stuff. Woohoo, thanks, appreciate it. And I'm gonna to try to add one, which is really just my charge to myself, which is I will do my level best not to glorify um, my criminality or my behavior and addiction. Sometimes uh, the salacious details of people's fall is more interesting than the hard, hard work of people getting back up. And it's easier for me to focus on that than to focus on the work that it took me to get to where I am today. Um, and so I ask myself and I give you permission to correct me if I am rambling on into the salacious details of my fall. So let me get started by qualifying myself. Um, I started drinking uh, when I was 14 years old. I started drinking alcoholically immediately. There was no kind of rise up and, and slow walk towards alcoholism. My first day of drinking, and I remember the day, it was uh, July 2nd of 1986. And I started drinking alcoholically immediately. Um, when I took my first sip of alcohol, I loved it. I loved the way it made me feel. And I wanted more and more and more and more and more of it. And normally, on any regular occasion, when I took a drink, I drank until I passed out. That's what stopped me from drinking more, passing out. It was like that on my first day of drinking, and it was like that 27 years later on my last day of drinking. It was never different. Um, I grew up in a perfectly normal household. I went to a great high school in Buffalo, New York. Um, I went to a Jesuit high school there. Um, I did very well in high school in spite of the fact that I drank my way through high school. Um, I played sports, I was a normal human being. I didn't drink every day, but if I got my whole, myself a hold of some booze, then I was gonna drink it until it was all gone. The other issue was because I drank alcoholically and because it's hard for a 14, 15 and 16 year old to get alcohol, I also tried a lot of other things in high school. Um, it's a limited experience that I have with a lot of other things, and I'm going to leave it at things for the time being, um, but it was a hell of a lot easier to get other things while I was in high school than it was to get booze. 
Um, and I experimented with a lot of other things. Um, I guess good news, bad news. Uh, the other things were not the object of my addiction. Um, I never felt the need for them. I found what worked and I knew it was booze. And I could not wait to get out of the house, away from my parents and away from the responsibilities of being a high school student to go enjoy life as an adult and be able to sit back and, and drink fine scotch and whiskey and do all the things that I thought adults did, right? And so I made my way to Georgetown University. And for the first time I was away from home and life was great, right? I loved it. I loved being in Washington, DC. I've got a political mind. So I loved what I was studying. I loved what I was able to do. Um, and for the first couple of years, it was fine, right? I still was able to binge drink on the weekends and I was able to just be with the rest of the crowd and everything was okay. And during the week I did my schoolwork and everything was fine. Um, and that came to an end in my third year, my second semester of my third year, where um, for whatever reasons, reasons unknown to me, um, for the first time in my life, alcohol took precedence over everything else in my life. It was the first time where I recognized that I had a relationship to alcohol that was such that no other relationship in my, my life mattered. Um, and I drank my way right out of Georgetown University for a year. Um, I had probably a three, four, three, five going into that semester. And that semester I got 8.6. That was my GPA for the semester. God only knows how I even got the 0.6, right? It should have been a 0.00. But it was a 0.6. I took an accounting exam for a class that I had never been to. Literally, I took an exam for a class I hadn't been to. Um, and the professor looked at me like, who are you? Oh, Byron Fogan. Congratulations, welcome. And I got the appropriate grade for such uh, laches. And, uh, and so my school asked me to excuse myself for a year um with the hope that i would get some help from my drinking problem that was certainly emerging and people were starting to be able to notice um and i did get help for my drinking problem to some extent what i did was i learned how to drink and still take care of my responsibility right so i took a year off i went to work full time i learned how to you know um get hammered and take enough advil that i could wake up without a hangover and go do it all over again and really, it was just the greatest training ground for what would come to be a life in active addiction um, and a life in what some people refer to as functional alcoholism. I don't like that term because I don't think it actually exists, but people certainly use it. Um, things went on that way for a long time. I, I ended up readmitting re into uh, Georgetown University and I was lucky enough to finish. I finished with a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations. Uh, my best friend was a gentleman from the, the Arabian slash Persian Gulf, depending on who you're talking to, um, from a small country called the United Arab Emirates. Um, he and I grew to be very close. He's my best buddy. Um, he did not drink. He was a practicing Muslim. Um, and he was super duper wealthy. He was the wealthiest person I'd ever met, probably to this day. I, I, I don't know that I've met somebody else wealthier. But at the time, as a guy from the east side of Buffalo, um, who was just kind of coming out of his shell, um, this was the most impressive thing that I had ever seen. Um, the wealth, the, the status, the access to power that I had as a 23, 24 year old kid um, who had befriended this guy um, was overwhelming for me. I went on to a career in business. I got married pretty early right after college um, and had a son pretty early right after college. And I hid my drinking pretty well from my wife um, until my son was born. And then once again, much like that third semester uh, or that second semester of my third year in college, once again, my, uh, my addiction overwhelmed me. And um, 
I guess I'll say, uh, took precedence to all the other relationships in my life, including my relationship with my wife and my son. Um, and I found myself by 29 years old with a child and with my first divorce under my belt. And I also found myself um, in a position where I lost a very lucrative business uh, right after 9-11. And right after 9-11, my buddy from the Persian Gulf who recognized that they had a messaging problem in the United States um, and that I had no more business to do, uh, we started doing business together. And I started doing messaging work and PR work for the government of the United Arab Emirates um, right after 2001. It was informal at first, um, but it became more and more formalized to a place where in 2005, um, he, who was then the director of international affairs for the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates, which is a crazy title to have, right? Again, as a guy from the east side of Buffalo, my buddy was the director of international affairs for the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates. It was a, my, a mouthful, but he asked me, to go to law school and to become his attorney. And of course I said, yes. Um, and I recall the day that I said, yes, my ex-wife, my then ex-wife, who I would later marry again, uh, looked at me and said that you will end up in prison because of this job. And she said that to me on August 14th of 2005. And she wasn't wrong hate that she wasn't wrong, but she wasn't wrong. That's my brief history up until coming to Albany Law School. I got on campus and immediately lost my car. That's what happened my first two days when I came to Albany Law School. I lived in the little campus housing, I don't remember what they call it, the Heights or something like that. I can't yeah, remember. It's UHA. It was a little yeah. dorm, right? Yeah. And I was like a 30 year old guy living in a dorm, which was terrible. Um, and I went out. It, it's really nice now. They, they did this whole new, yeah, you'll have to come and see it. It was really nice then. It was fine, <laughs> but not because of my behavior though. My behavior didn't make it any better. Um, I lost my car. I, I went out, uh, drinking and, and I had no idea where my car went. Um, it turns out that I parked it on the top level of the parking lot where nobody went where there was no reason to park because there were like five levels of parking prior to that, but that's where it ended up. But I lost my car for like four days, no idea where it was. And I had a conversation with myself in the mirror that said, there's no way you're gonna make it through law school if you drink, you can't drink. Okay. And so I made that decision that I would only drink at certain times. And one of the hallmarks of addiction are, is the need to control your drinking, right? So this is, this is one of those things where you can write down in a note somewhere for yourself or for somebody else. If you feel the need or somebody else feels the need to control their drinking, they probably have a drinking problem because normal people don't have to do that, right? Normal people go out, have a glass of wine, leave a little bit at the bottom or whatever, and then they're fine, right? A guy like me can't do that. And so I had to control my drinking. And so I came up with a whole set of rules around what I would do in order to be able to function well in law school and not drink. Um, and I did that pretty successfully while school was in session. I was given a pretty prestigious uh, internship for my first year, which is unnormal, but I, I, I was able to go work for a pretty prestigious law firm in upstate New York and Rochester. Um, and I found that I was incapable of continuing those same rules while I was working at that law firm. And I came up with a huge number of excuses as to why I drank the way I did and why I was incapable of holding myself together. One of which was the death of one of my best friends. One of my closest friends killed himself uh, during that summer. And I look back on it and I say, okay, that sounds like a good reason to do what I did to myself, but it was an awful reason. In fact, he was also an addict and it should have been the thing to shake me from doing what I was doing. Instead, it was the excuse I used in order to damn near drink my way right out of that internship. 
it's a miracle that they allowed me to finish. But they allowed me to finish, as it turns out, because I already had this job with this really, really high value client. And so that facade of being an attorney and already coming with a client kept them keeping me on because, but for that, there's no reason they should have had me there. I, I, I used to start drinking with some of the old retired partners at one o'clock in the afternoon on Fridays. And we would just open a bottle of scotch because my client used to give me huge, very expensive bottles of scotch and I would just share it with them. Um, and so I almost drank my way out of that internship, but somehow I made it through. They obviously did not extend me an offer and I obviously had no desire to go back to Rochester. Um, but I learned again, hey, Byron, you can't drink while you're in law school. Try to hold it together and piece it together so you'll be okay. Um, and I did that. I worked out, I did all kinds of other things and I found other substances, much to my chagrin to admit, I found other substances that allowed me to stay awake and attend to law school um, without some of the hangover effects of alcohol. And um, while that wasn't my drug of choice, that certainly was my drug of choice while I was there. Um, and it kept me out of trouble to whatever extent it did. Um, and I did pretty well in law school. I, 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 law school was a great place for me to be a functional alcoholic because I was required to kind of be present like once a semester, right? To take my exam. Um, the entire rest of the semester, as long as I was doing my readings, um, I could kind of function and no one would really know what was going on with me. So one of the suggestions I'm going to have later on is make sure you develop a network of supportive people, right? You're here in a very supportive environment. Make sure you develop a network of supportive people because practicing law in isolation is a recipe for disaster. We'll come to that a little bit later. But I did make it through law school. Um, no one really knew what was going on with me. Um, my, I remarried my wife during that terrible first year experience um, that I had in Rochester. We got remarried because, you know, I put on the facade of looking like a together attorney and she thought that I had uh, solved all my problems. I hadn't. Um, so, my wife was in Syracuse, I was in Albany, nobody was seeing what I was doing and I could disappear all semester long. It was great, it was perfect. Um, life went on that way, my grades were okay, um, at least they were okay enough to graduate. Um, but I was presented with an opportunity to go support my client for a presidential visit in 2008. That meant that I needed to leave law school early because I would not have been able to do this work. Um, I worked, I, I took classes through my second summer and was able to, while not graduate early, was able to be remote for that last semester. And I went to work for my client in 2008. Um, and by the time graduation rolled around in May of 2008, I was already making pretty good money. I was pretty happy and I was pretty stable. And I showed up in Albany to graduate, to walk and get my cap and gown. Um, and promptly missed a police officer, missed crashing into a police officer the night before graduation by about a foot, driving completely and utterly hammered in the middle of Albany. They pulled me over, um, screamed at me, asked me what I was doing in town because I had a Maryland license at the time because I had moved back to Maryland. And I told them that I was graduating from law school the next day and they let me go. They let me go. Um, my career would have been over had I killed that cop. Not only would my career have been over, um, you know, life as I knew it would have been over. That should have stopped me. It did not. In fact, the fact that I got out of it fueled my addiction for several years because I got out of things all the time because of the facade of being an attorney. Um, this was the first one. It wasn't the last. Um, 
I ended up walking the next day. I got my cap and gown and everything was great. And I embarked on what should have been a very lucrative, fun, happy experience. Um, and it wasn't. Um, I embarked on what was probably a six or seven year dive into the depths, the worst depths of addiction um, to a place where ultimately I ended up in federal prison. So that's my qualifier. I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm qualified to talk to you about the pain of addiction and what it can be like. Um, and so what does all that mean, right? That's my experience. There's a lot of people who can listen to that story and say, oh, that'll never happen to me. How would that happen to me? How would I get to a place where I drank my way out of my career? How would I get to a place where I, I was almost crashing into cops the day before um, graduation? How could I get to a place where um, I would give away a family? I would give away this career that I worked so hard for. Um, and there's one word that I can describe that says how you get to that place and that's isolation. Isolation. This practice is one that if you want to, you don't have to interact with anybody. If you're the type of person that doesn't want to interact with people, if you um, want to hide, if, if, if you are introverted to an uncomfortable place, you can find a place in this, in this profession. Um, I am a painfully shy introverted person. You wouldn't know it because I can overcome it, but I am a painfully shy and introverted person. This profession allowed me to hide quite a lot. 95% of my practice was reading. I sat in the office and I read 95% of the years that I practiced law. Um, and the other 5% were like little bursts of being very, very high profile in public, but they were very short. And usually there was someone in front of me because I was in support of a foreign government. Um, and I did not develop the network of colleagues and mentors and, and, um, and even mentees that could have at least helped me to identify the crisis that I was causing myself while I was descending into addiction. Um, I descended into addiction all alone. And as long as I was develop, developing and delivering work product, um, I was able to escape anybody's scrutiny. And, you know, we teach professional responsibility and I'm, I'm not taking a shot at law school. I'm not taking a shot at the institution itself, but we definitely teach re professional responsibility as a, a set of rules and prohibited conduct, right? That's how I learned professional responsibility. I, I would imagine that others would be able to, to back me up on that. Um, so I was taught these kind of bright line things like, you can go up to this line, but don't go over it. But there wasn't a lot of information and I could not find a lot of information on how to stop myself from walking up to that line. How to stop myself from going down the path to a place where I did not feel like I could change course as I got up to that line. Um, for me, changing course was more, was less like stopping a car and turning and more like trying to turn a cruise ship or a, an ocean line, right? And once I was on a course, it became very, very difficult to change course as I was coming up to that line. You know, you don't have to just see my experience, but oftentimes you'll see these very high profile attorneys who find themselves running afoul of the professional rules. And as somebody who's in recovery today, I, I can look at it and I can see long before it happens. Wow, that guy's in trouble. I, I look at the, the, the case of Michael Avenatti, right? Anybody who followed Michael Avenatti, if, you, if you're a recovering addict, like I am, um, 
I watched his behavior long before he got in trouble. And I was like, wow, that guy's in horrible danger. Why isn't anybody telling him that he's in trouble, that he is, um, that he is on a pathway towards violating the professional rules such that he'll never be able to practice again. And he happens to be a fellow of Georgetown University. I don't know him, but I think he went to Georgetown Law. And I remember having many conversations with people like, wow, somebody should really grab a hold of him. Does anybody know him? Somebody should grab a hold of him and stop him. But we're able to practice in isolation. And, you know, we're giving these bright line, these, these bright line rules. And as long as we don't go afoul of them, we feel like we're okay. Well, I would suggest that that's probably, that there might be a different way that we can we can teach professional ethics to our attorneys um, because there are some signs and symptoms long before somebody violates a rule that could, um, where we could start turning that ship. Um, I mentioned earlier that I grew to hate my client. And again, these professional rules and responsibilities don't talk about um, what to do when you hate your client. So I spoke about leaving law school to go on this great journey and support a presidential uh, visit to the country that I represented. And um, I landed on the ground in the UAE on, I believe it was January 8th. It was either the 7th or the 8th. And within two days, I had had a gun pointed at me three times. Um, because I kept on violating security perimeters and I had to get information from my client to represent the United States over and over again. And the only identification I had in order to be able to do that was a Maryland driver's license while I'm in the middle of the goddamn UAE. Um, that was my first experience in this new great job that I had just worked three years in order to get a gun to my head. Um, I'm not violating anybody's confidentiality. I had a gun to my head. This is not a, a legal issue. I had a freaking gun to my head. And I hated my client. And nobody told me how to get rid of my client. Nobody told me how to quit. I had a five-year commitment because they paid for me to go to law school. And I did not know what to do. I had no idea what to do. I had no colleagues in order to be able to ask what to do. I had no finances that were beyond what I was getting paid in order to be able to say, you know what, I quit. And so this is why I talk about practicing law in isolation is a really, really, really dangerous thing. Doesn't mean solo practice is a dangerous thing. It just means practicing in isolation is a dangerous thing. Um, one of my biggest suggestions would be that, um, somehow you develop a mentor network or colleague network so that when you leave Albany Law School, when you leave your, your circumstance and take the bar, that without divul divulging confidential information, you have someone to talk to about your practice. You have somewhere to go to talk to about the practice of law and how it's affecting you and how you feel about your clients and how you feel about the things you're supporting so that you can start turning that ocean liner long before you start developing the problems that can, can go wrong um, if you're unable to turn that ocean line. So what can we do then, right? Here's the circumstance. You got a guy in front of you who drank his way all the way into federal prison, right? Because that's what I did. I drank and gambled my way into federal prison. The end of my addiction looked like this. I was all alone. I drank myself out of my marriage. I drank myself away from anybody I cared about. And I simply got jealous and started to hate my client such that I ended up taking $2 million from him and transferring it directly to casino cages and playing and gambling his money in order to make enough money so I could get away from him. That was literally the psychopathic thought that I had. I'm going to use his money to make enough money so I don't have to work for him anymore. That's some of the weird, twisted thinking of an addict um, 
And it's the delusional thinking of somebody who had just lost his way and didn't know how to get out of the circumstance that he was in. Thank God, thank God that I was able to find a bottom that made me take a look at what was happening and it hurt so much and the pain was so great that I was able to face the consequences of what I was doing because facing those consequences was no longer as painful as continuing my life in addiction. There's a greatness in the bottom, right? But my bottom looked like this. I was being pursued by the FBI. I was being pursued by local law enforcement folks because I had broken into a restaurant in order to steal alcohol. Um, I went from being somebody who, you know, was invited to dinners at the Supreme Court to somebody who couldn't stay out of jail, just waking up in the morning. Um, Professor Connors knew me from back at uh, Albany Law Days. Uh, I was not a person who looked like a homeless guy. Like that's not how I presented myself. But more times than not, I had to beg for money to put money in my gas tank because I gambled all my money away. I drank all my money away. Um, and I, I was a menace at the end of my addiction. And it was a beautiful place because it, it was so painful that it allowed me to wake up, to ask for help, and to start addressing some of the issues that I needed to address um, and some of the lives that I had ruined on my way down. So there's a lot of things that I wish had happened differently. They didn't. But like, we have a chance now to start a process that we can avoid the people who we know. We, we can help avoid the consequences to people that we know. The first thing is, you know, by this presentation, I hope to start destigmatizing uh, what addiction looks like. Addiction doesn't look like a guy in a brown paper bag with ripped up clothes and, and sitting there panhandling on the sidelines. It can, but that's not what it looks like. Addiction looks like me, you know, I'm sitting here with my J. Coo Shaw collar sweater and, you know, I sat in classroom with suits and ties and I, I did all the things and I was just as much of an addict as anybody with a needle sticking out of their arm in the park right now, just as much, um, if not worse, because I had the funds to be able to do it. Um, addiction is a relationship, it's not consequences. There are consequences to addiction, but it's not what addiction is. Addiction is a relationship, a maladaptive, maladjusted relationship that some people have to substances and behaviors. That's it. It's not a failing. It's not a moral failing. It's not, a, it's, it's not some kind of um, failure of ethics. It is a relationship. And we can all have bad relationships, have bad relationships with people. We can have bad relationships to things. So we can start working to destigmatize addiction, not for the purpose to make it okay, but for the purpose to make it okay for people to seek help. I know in our profession, one of the most difficult things is to be able to go out and admit that I need help, right? Our reputation means everything to us, sometimes beyond self-care and self-reflection. Our reputation became, for me, my reputation was more important than any self-care or self-reflection. It was important to me to be Byron Fogan Esquire more than it was important for me to be Byron Fogan healthy guy, Byron Fogan um, good steward of my finances, Byron Fogan um, I choose to be a dad today rather than choose to be a lawyer. My reputation was more important to me than all of those things. And oddly enough, I held on to my reputation so much that I actually broke it. It was my fault. I did it to me. And so I ask that we start thinking about destigmatization, not again to, to kind of, um, excuse the behavior of people who are living in active addiction, but in order to encourage them to seek help, because that's the only way that they can fix the issue. Um, I feel like I've talked and rambled on enough. I feel like I should leave about 15 minutes for some questions. 
um, I could talk about this for an entire semester. I could talk about this for a year. Um, I was an active addict for 27 years um, and I've been active in recovery for eight. I live a beautiful, healthy life today. Um, recovery allowed me to face the consequences of my actions um, with grace and use the, the horror of my descent into, um, in, towards my bottom in order to help other people. So I've got a great life today. Um, I am not a practicing attorney. Obviously you get a, uh, you know, you sit in the federal pen for a year or two. They don't let you practice law anymore. Not immediately, at least. I still hold out hope. Through God, all things are possible. But nonetheless, I'm pretty doggone happy and I'm really, really glad I've gotten to share this with you. I, I hope you guys have some questions and I'm sorry I talked for so long. Thanks. Thank you. So I, I actually do have a question, but I don't, I want to see if any of the students want to ask anything first. Anyone have a question? Go ahead, Shivani, please. Question. I mean, so you talked about like, I, you mentioned, you know, it's important to not be isolated and to have that network. If you notice people like, you know, around you who may be struggling, like what would you suggest to like reach out to them? Like how would you reach out to them or talk to them about these issues? So rather than focusing, and I can't, you know, I have my own belief on how we find recovery. Um, and, it, and it may be in opposition to this, but one thing that you can do is just talk to them, right? Talk to them, give them an ear. Um, if it's somebody who you are close with, um, don't be scared to have the hard conversation. We have hard conversations with people all the time. I do not understand why we have such difficulty having the hard conversation around addiction with people. We're attorneys for Christ's sake. I've had to have conversations with people who I knew were going to prison. You're going to prison. Get your affairs in order, right? That's a hard conversation to have with somebody. But I was able to do it. But I was incapable of looking at a friend of mine who was drinking too much and saying, hey, man, what about this? What's going on with you that you're drinking that heavy? I still struggle with it. And I've been in, I do this for a living. So it's, again, it's part of the destigmatization, right? We can just, destigmatize this to a point where having that conversation is not so uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable conversation because of what it means reputationally to somebody, because there is still such a stigma around addiction. So I, I would encourage you to be as brave in that as you would be in your le zealous representation of a client. Be brave in having that conversation. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Got it. Anyone else have any questions? So Byron, I just want to thank you for sharing all of that with us. It's um, very much appreciated and so important that we have these conversations and we are really trying to um, make you proud in your effort to destigmatize by by having conversations like this, which we probably should have more often, but um, we appreciate you taking the time and, and doing this for us. So my my question sort of related to Shivani's, actually Shivani's question was part of my question, but you mentioned, um, you know, certainly Michael Avenatti is, is it probably an obvious example of something you might notice, but are there other things that we should look out for, right? So when you say, you know, there are people who are in trouble and you wish someone would reach out to them and you just talked a little bit to Shivani about how to do that. Um, are there things that we should look for, you know, whether it's your classmate or a student or colleague, um, family member, is there any, are there any things or, or do you have any advice on things we should look out for? So 
I think it's change of behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that's a hallmark of a good attorney and a hallmark of a lot of the students who are very motivated to go to law school is that they have, they have certain behaviors. They're kind of, and they're kind of consistent in their behavior, right? So the best students and the ones who emerge and end up in law school or medical school, they're kind of consistent in their behavior. Um, if you see radical changes in someone's behavior, either day to day or even a slide from where they were to where they are, that is a big red flag. I can tell you that every bender that I went on, and I went on thousands of them, they always started with a lie. They always started with a substantial change in my behavior, a substantial change, a radical departure from what I would normally do. So. I was normally a person who liked to be on time. I was normally a person who liked to show up. I certainly liked social situations, but suddenly for two or three months, I would disappear. Hmm. Even though I was still present, I disappeared. I wasn't doing the other things. I wasn't meeting with people after class. I wasn't talking to people. Um, that radical departure is a big red flag to say, hey, maybe something's going on. And it might not be just addiction. It might be some other mental health issue. Mm -hmm. That radical departure is something that I would encourage people to look for in the people around them, the people who they're working with, or the people who are working for them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey there, Byron. Good to, good to see you. Hey, how are you? Good. I'm sorry I'm, I'm late. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, I can identify to some of that. Um, I've been open and I'll say right now, I'm an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess I'm thinking, I didn't become an alcoholic when I started law school. It started way before then. Um, just wondering if there's any way we could get a message to students to look at themselves at the beginning of the process. For me, it was, yeah, uh, all right, I'm gonna put my old ways behind me and not drink as much anymore in law school, but that didn't happen, right? Um, but I wonder if, if I would have heard that message in my first year, or if, I, if there was a support group, um, a 12-step program or whatever available, whether or not I would have popped my head in. Um, so, and then I don't know what my question is, but some people say that there's so many alcoholics and there's so much mental illness among lawyers that a certain type of person is drawn to the practice of, of law. So which came first? Was it the, the process that corrupted us or was it there before? Um, and what difference does it make, right? Um, you, you think there's any like uh, shock wake up uh, strategies that we could use to try to get through to people? So I, I really do believe, and I, and I spoke about this a little earlier, and it, it's something that I believe wholeheartedly that we talk about addiction too often as a set of consequences. And so if you haven't experienced those consequences, it's hard for you to identify as an addict. But addiction, alcoholism, any addiction, because I've got several of them. Like I'm, I'm addicted to drugs, alcohol, and compulsive gambling. Like those are, those are my big three. They, they destroyed my life. <laughs> but I'm not an addict because of the consequences of my addiction. I'm an addict because I had a relationship that was maladapted to these three things, right? And so if we can start having more of a conversation about what that looks like, if we can talk about isolation, if we can talk about, like, I've got the best anecdote in the world as to what I know made me an alcoholic. Like, I know it today. I didn't know it then. I used to, in order to control my drinking, I had a little memo pad, and I used to make tick marks as to how many drinks I had. I want somebody who's a non-alcoholic to, to ask themselves, would there ever be a moment in their life where they felt like they needed to make tick marks? to keep track of the number of drinks they had? They'd say no. And so I'd like us to talk 
in general, in the whole recovery space, I'd like us to talk more about the relationship, what the relationship looks like, what that feels like, what it feels like to be an alcoholic, so that people can relate into that rather than simply and solely relating to the consequences. Because oftentimes, if you're talking about consequences, you're already too late, right? If I have to have a DUI to know that I was an alcoholic, there's a chance that I've already driven drunk thousands of times. Because before I got my first DUI, I didn't get my first DUI until I was 25 years into my addiction. Which means I drove drunk thousands of times. I put people's lives at risk thousands of times. And if the place that I understood that I was an addict was all the way at the point of getting a DUI, that's too late. It's too late. So I hope that answers the question, but that's, that's my suggestion. That's what I try to do. I try to talk about what addiction looks like not as a set of consequences, but as a maladaptive relationship. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, from my experience, it's a love relationship. Um, it's a toxic love relationship. <laughs> right, right. But maybe asking students, hey, how many of you love to go <laughs> out and booze it up? There'd be a lot of hands, I bet. Um, it starts somewhere. Got to start somewhere. Yeah. And again, um, it, I, I think that it really helps to have somebody who's willing to talk about their experience, right? Because it might be hard for somebody to explain. I couldn't have explained my alcoholism while I was active in my alcoholism. But someone could have explained theirs and I could probably relate to it. And so I, I also think that that's important. That's, that's the role that I try to fulfill now, right? If, if there's any benefit to everything that I went through, that's the benefit that I, I, I get to give that back to the world. And I know you're here to help others, but I'm also, maybe it's inappropriate at this time. time um, if there's anything we can do to help you. I know attorneys that have been in federal prison that got readmitted to practice. So um, keep that hope alive um, if, that, if that's your, one of your goals. It, it is, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, and there will be a day where I will call on you guys in order to help me with that. It ain't today though. I kind of enjoy this life. I got, I've got piercings in my face and I ride around in motorcycles. Like I wasn't able to do that when I was a practicing attorney. So there's, there's a part of this that's fun. I get all the glory of being a JD without any of the responsibilities. So, <laughs> but one day, yes, I, I will probably, um, I, I do desire to return to the practice. I was a damn good attorney. And I think that's the other thing that gets lost when somebody gets in trouble. Like some of the guys who got in trouble, some of the women who get in trouble, they were damn good attorneys, right? And, and there is something that we lose when we don't give people the opportunity to rehabilitate themselves, right? So that, that is a different discussion and I'm happy to have that discussion. And it does sound self-serving, but I was a damn good attorney and I'm, a, I'm a, a billion times better an attorney today than I was as a practicing addict. And I don't get to do that. I still do advise people and I, I send them along their way, but I, I do not practice law and I make sure that people know I don't practice law, but there are many different ways you get to use your law degree. But I know for a fact, I am a better attorney today than I ever was any day that I had a bottle up to my mouth. And uh, it is sad that, that we do not allow for the uh, rehabilitation of somebody's reputation in order to allow them back into the practice. Because I can guarantee you that in almost every instance, if they've really done the work, they're a better attorney today than they were the day before they got in trouble. Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I, so we, Byron, we have a class that is trying to get into the classroom. Sure. So um, is that what you were gonna say, Sarah? Sorry. I was going to say thank you so much for being here. And, and thank you for being here. Yes. 
And this is amazing, and I, we really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited for people to be able to watch this recording um, and hear what you know you said. So thank you again. We really appreciate it, and I'm honored that you're an alum of the school that I go to. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, thank you everybody for coming.